Hello and welcome back to the channel. Amber here, joined by Laura, and today we are tackling the next episode of House of the Dragon titled Small Folk. Laura, how are you doing? Uh, I found this episode to be really amusing in a handful of ways. Me too. Me too. There were many parts that I don't know if they were supposed to be funny, but I found them very funny. Uh, yeah. I have a big question just to start out. Won't the dragon seeds need to learn High Valerian like super fast? <laughs> ooh, ooh, if that if that plot hole isn't is remedy addressed. Yeah. <laughs> I hope everybody has Duolingo. <laughs> Right? They've got like <laughs> currently like translating while flying. You know, and like the way that it was built up that first scene of when the Kingsguard is gonna, the Darkland Kingsguard is gonna try and bond with Sea Smoke. I love how Sea Smoke was like, yeah, okay, go ahead, hop on. And then he gets close and he was like, Sea Smoke's like, guys, I didn't mean that shit. You're dead now. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, I have some things to say about Sea Smoke. Before it might be we get my, into <laughs> my favorite dragon now because Sea Smoke is on some silly shit. Like before we get too far into Sea Smoke, I just want to say if you're listening, if you've been with us since like the beginning of the season, make sure you like and subscribe because we we will be covering the last two episodes. And we will be covering, I'm assuming, more of the spinoff series as they come out. But yeah, Sea Smoke was a delight. Before we started today, I was going to ask you, like, you know, like our typical The Smog Award, who was the most theatrical? Sea Smoke, all the way. It's Sea Smoke, but like, I, I have another, like, I feel like I might have a tie with Sea Smoke, but, but that'll come later. I really appreciate Sea Smoke being like, only beautiful men with dreadlocks may ride me. You know, that I, is all. <laughs> I love how Sea Smoke shows up out of nowhere and it's like, oh, I see your dreads, sir. You belong to me now. <laughs> He's like, don't fight it. Don't fight it. We're meant to be together. The way yes. that Sea Smoke chased him around and then was like, surprise, <laughs> I'm here again. <laughs> Very Sergeant Dokes. Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. Oh, uh, yeah, that was great. It almost felt like a little Benny Hill. Like you need that like chase music as he's running about. I almost feel like this episode there were missing scenes. And so they had to like go back and like create more because something that they wanted like didn't work. Like did they run out of dragon budget and we couldn't get Adam of Hull like getting on sea smoke we just get to hear about it and then they were like oh no like i guess add some filler like just guys just go back to damon tripping his balls off again <laughs> <laughs> we've spent so much time with damon tripping so much time with him you know i know that this is like off topic now that we're on damon but i really appreciate that his redemption arc is happening in a hallucination how convenient <laughs> for him Right? He doesn't have to, like, take any accountability. It's just all in his own no, head. No, he yeah, he just, to... he does it in his own head, and he's going to come out the other side and somehow probably be a hero, which is great for him. Also great for Rhaenyra, as she is deeply conflicted about his loyalties. What happened? She sent the one guy out there, one of her advisors. He hasn't shown up yet, and it begs the question, why hasn't she just sent one of her sons or someone on dragon back to like check in oh because with i'm too much yeah like i feel like as you know the ruler i would be too much of a control freak to be like eh, we'll just you know let it play out we'll see what's going on with damon later ma'am you are the queen you need to figure this out <laughs> like don't play by chance here yeah just bring him to heal somebody needs to bring damon to heal and obviously that's going to be a hallucinogen <laughs> Damon's biggest nemesis. <laughs> Damon's op is hallucinogens. <laughs> Hallucinogenics. Yes. That's his real op. Have you seen the memes going around about Alice and <laughs> Ramsey Fulton? <laughs> 
<laughs> the one where it's like ancestor descendant. Yes. And it looks like the same person. Yeah, they look like siblings. I mean, just throw a black long wig on Ramsey Bolton and call it a day. Yes. Speaking of wigs. That wig is very wiggy. Oh, Alice's wig? A lot of the wigs on this show are very wiggy. Yeah, but some are like surprisingly really good. Some are very good, but there is an equal amount that are not very good. And we're having this conversation because both Laura and I have worked with wigs in the past. We're not just coming out of this from left field. We're professionals. (laughs) 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 What are some of the other moments of this episode outside of Damon and his hallucinogenics and sea smoke and his (laughs) antics that stick out to you. (laughs) I can barely keep it together thinking about sea smoke chasing Adam up all around that island. I mean, for me, it's Alice at Hightower getting (laughs) smacked in the face with a, like, wet fish. Oh, that was pretty good, too. The shock on her face made it so good. But poor (laughs) Helena, every time she goes out in public, the small folk seem to have some sort of revolt in her presence. Like, let her just stay in the Red Keep from now on. Her nerves weren't built for this. That's what I was thinking. Every time her mother is like, come on, Helena, we're going on a trip. She's just got to be like, no, 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 not again. Ooh, you know what I'm really looking forward to that we saw the basis of in this episode? Is Reyna getting a dragon on the veil. Yeah, I'm, look, I was so certain that today or this episode was going to be the dragon episode. Like, you get a dragon, you get a dragon. And it was only Adam, which was kind of disappointing, because I was really hoping to get back to Reyna. Yeah, me too. I am glad, though, that we saw the precursor of the dragon is there, and I think we know what's going to happen. She's getting a dragon. I can't wait. It'll be the best moment of this season. I've been waiting since the beginning for that girl to get a dragon. I'm kind of interested in, so if it's, this, if it's the dragon that everyone thinks it is, if it's Sheep Stealer... I notice, like when she comes, she comes up to this like burnt area. This dragon isn't like killing and eating the sheep; it's just burning the sheep. <laughs> there was just like whole sheep's torched with like the whole skeleton there. Does that mean that sheep stealer isn't just like killing to eat, but it's just killing to kill? Because that makes it instantly like way more scary. I yeah. Feel like, or, you know, that's just that it was an accident. They didn't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the dragon accidentally unleashed all that fire. <laughs> no, no, no. I meant like the writer. <laughs> oh, I was thinking, like, how would a dragon accidentally do something like that? Sneezed, <laughs> sneezing fit. It could be. I mean, there's been like seasonal I don't think, allergies. <laughs> I don't think that anybody that watches this can realistically say that there are not any plot holes in the show whatsoever. I mean, don't get me wrong, I enjoy it, but there's there's definitely loose ends that are never tied. There's some plot <laughs> holes. We're just moving along. We're just cruising about. It's the writer's world. We're just living in it. Yeah, exactly. I'm, now I'm just envisioning Sheep Stealer with like dainty, you know, like a little steak knife and <laughs> a fork, like picking around the bones after it's absolutely <laughs> torched the sheep. It has a delicate palate. Yeah, yeah. We've got that dragon. We also got a baby dragon, which, girl, if any harm comes to that baby dragon, I will flip my shit. I probably watched that little clip of that baby dragon two or three times. I would die of cuteness overload. I would die for that baby dragon. Absolutely. Like, what a precious little gem. What a star. What a star in the making. On a more serious note, though, Masaria and Rhaenyra's little plan of delivering survival necessities to King's Landing and marked, you know, black Targaryen boats. Brilliant. That was brilliant to sow discord amongst the small folk of King's Landing, because I think we've talked about this before, like 
the population of King's Landing is actually enormous. Yeah. To stir discord and stoke the frames of rebellion against them with the small folk is a brilliant idea. And like they touch on it through the episode where they talk about like how much harder it is to fight a war abroad when you are having to keep the peace at home. It makes really good sense for them to kind of enact this type of I, you know, it's like it's like airdrops. So all of these scenes, right, when like you've got all of the small folk like carrying little bundles of food and then it cuts to Hugh the hammer and he just knocks some guy out, <laughs> and, like grabs his satchel of food. And I was like, OK, I guess now we're supposed to understand more things about him because so far he's been in a really sympathetic light where it's like. He's here for his wife and his daughter. He wants his daughter to survive. He's doing his best. And then you cut to this. And I don't know if it's just meant to show like, hey, he's really, really desperate. Or if there's like some kind of underlying thing with him where he's not exactly like, he's not the most like pure of intentions. He's not like just a good coded character. He's willing to do stuff, which I kind of like. Right. I took it as kind of like a precursor to what side he's inevitably going to fall on because he's experiencing all of this hardship. The crown has made promises to him in the past that they have not upheld because obviously they just don't see it as something that needs to be upheld. And now we have him in this time of like famine within the Red Keep. And then he sees that people are getting, you know, food deliveries Well, they're taking from these food deliveries from Rhaenyra. Without it being said, it's a bridge to him leaving King's Landing and heading towards Rhaenyra. I guess we know his motivations right now. But yeah, I'm liking the little bits of his story a lot. But I also really liked this character in the book. I think my idea of the book character was a little bit more unhinged. Like he was a little bit more... hmm, outspoken boombastic more of like a not villainous but just kind of like menacing and the way that they've presented him on the show is kind of like you know he's just trying to get by he's a good dude but like I could see how his circumstances and his actions will change and could change based on how wild things are getting around him right due to the circumstances yeah but no like you said that whole plan Missaria is probably the best advisor that Rhaenyra has right now absolutely her circle has had nothing no ideas the only thing that kind of was like a good idea was Jace going off and kind of like doing things on his own, she's got nobody. And it's kind of frustrating because you would like to think that like she's gathered up, you know, all of her advisors. Some of these people like have to be, they have to be intelligent, right? But no, Masaria is the one who's getting things done. So good for them, good for her. Good for the writers to give give this character something to do. Yeah, this episode was strangely like, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. It was very entertaining, but there's also, it was strangely like lacking at the same time. It was almost like they were trying to cram in a bunch of small moments to get us to where we're going in the next couple episodes. I agree. I really enjoyed the previous episode because it felt like we were getting all of this character work. And then on this episode, I was like really I guess I was expecting the pacing just to be off the charts because the last episode slowed down a little bit. But I kind of almost wish that this episode being, you know, named the small folk would have really like sat with our, you know, less noble characters. Like the Hulls, we did get some interesting interactions with them, but it wasn't a ton. Like, Alan of Hall shaving his head. I love how in this world, like, any secret Targaryen, you got to shave the head. You know, can't let right. that, that white hair be seen. I still don't really feel like I know who those these two characters are, despite having them kind of pop in and out of multiple episodes. Now, Ulf, 
the guy that was in the little like tavern eating the gross fish soup. Yeah. I really enjoyed his little moment. For some reason, I feel like I know exactly who this guy is in comparison to the other dragon seeds. Yeah, I would definitely agree there. And I don't know why exactly either. Maybe it's just like his characteristics were like much more on display where the other characters are much more guarded. He's more of like an entertaining type, you know, like he's a talker. He's kind of like a jokester, you know, like he feels he feels like very like obvious. Like if that guy came into the room, you'd be like, oh, like, you know, this guy, you know him. We know him. Yeah, I definitely see what you're saying there. Plus, he's been, like, standing on business about his position from the first time we met him. That's true. So his interactions was with the madam or prostitute, Amon's madam? Yeah, looks like Amon turned her loose and started picking up some different ones, and she doesn't seem too happy about that. Are we to assume that... She was just, you know, like masking for the customer. Like he had a very different idea about who she was. Or is she actually just like, he left. My income is like (laughs) dwindling now because of it. I mean, if I were her, I would be upset too. He wants to visit and pay you until there's like some issues within King's Landing. And now everybody's starving. And now he wants to switch and feed and entertain the other workers instead of you, I'd be mad if I were her too. Like, she's been dealing with his very individual proclivities this whole time. Right. And then he just leaves her to fend for herself when it comes to, like, the feasting and merriment. Yeah, that's messed up, man. She's she's been there for him. He owes he owes her a nice <laughs> he dinner. He owes her a nice <laughs> dinner and some merriment. Exactly. I don't blame her for being out in the taverns running her mouth. (laughs) Honestly, I could take a whole episode of what's being said in these taverns, to be honest. Oh, absolutely. That would be highly enjoyable. You title the episode The Small Folk. Give us give us the rumors. I want the rumor mill, the seedy establishment. I want the hot goss. Exactly. Exactly. They could have really went with it this episode, and I probably would have enjoyed that more than Rhaenyra looking longingly out to the sea. <laughs> <laughs> she does a lot of that. She does a whole lot of that. If we go back to King's Landing, we do have that moment between Alicent and Gwen. Yeah. I thought that was really good. And I, you know, like I'm I feel like we're they're still kind of like saying the same things over and over again. Like we're we're still having these conversations, but it's just something about these two characters that I find interesting. I find it interesting that the writers have decided to go through with the Darian plot. And so now we're hearing about Darian a lot more because she's all like, What about my youngest? How is he? Well, girl, you didn't seem to be concerned up until very recently. I mean, isn't that odd, though? I don't want to be like, oh, the writers just like forgot or whatever, because I don't think they forgot. I just think it wouldn't have made much sense to bring his story into the mix until it's really like relevant. Right. But I do think that they could have dropped that there was a fourth child. They could have like, you know, been more obvious about there being a fourth child. Like there could have been some like naming recognition of Darian's existence in season one, but we didn't even hear about him until season two. Like he wasn't even brought to King's Landing when his father was dying. And another thing that I was thinking as well is when Alicent and Gwen are having this conversation, they bring up the topic of like nature versus nurture, where Gwen is like, ah, you know, like perhaps him being raised outside of King Landing was a good thing. And Alicent was like, well, was it that or was it just like me not being there that made him a better person? And when she said that, I was like, "Is hear me out, hear me out. <laughs> Is it possible that it's just Otto Hightower? <laughs> it could be. Well, it could be that and it could be possible that it's a combination of the two. That yeah. Darian was raised outside of the Red Keep, which seems to have a penchant for turning male 
offspring into petulant little shits. Yeah. And it could be that Allison doesn't have, I would say, the best grasp on parenting. I have to, like, tell myself that she was a child when she was having children herself. You see it, too, in, like, real life. Like, young, very young people having children struggle much right. harder. <laughs> but, yeah, it could be both. The politics, the, like, undercurrents of all of the backstabbing and whatnot in King's Landing can't be a good environment. But also, like, Allison is a shitty parent because her dad didn't give her the right tools, right? Like, he yeah. he wasn't there for her. She didn't have a mother around. She had a lot working against her. But, man, if Otto would have been a different person, Allison would have been a different person. Her children would have been different people. I feel like this whole conversation was, like, missing the thought of, like, generational trauma from parents. <laughs> yeah. You know, speaking of her children, everybody seems very chill except for a couple people about how, I don't know, psychopathic Eamon is. That's, yes. Yes. They just have to be scared, right? Is that the best... Yeah, I would assume that it's fear, but like that fear seems to drive Crispy Cole to at least make a passive attempt at reason with him. And I'm sure what Kristen witnessed like at Rook's Rest where he saw Eamon standing over Agent and, you know, you can tell in that moment from that episode that he was like, oh shit, he's going to kill him. And like you can see it in Kristen Cole now that he's still kind of worried about that. Do you think that there will ever be an episode where Crispy has a face to face with Rhaenyra where he realizes he f***ed up and like he threw his cards in with the wrong with the wrong group, especially after seeing what Aemon is up to? I don't know if we'll see that, but I think that it would do a lot if it happened. Yeah, I'm really curious if there will be some type of comeback moment. Yeah, as a character, though, I struggle to believe that Crispy will take accountability at that level. Yeah, he uh, he's so, he's not very self-aware. It's unfortunate. And I think, like, oh my gosh, I posted that clip of us talking about Crispy Cole or Viserys from Game of Thrones. <laughs> And overwhelmingly, the response was, well, besides, like, the few, like, can I throw myself off a cliff instead <laughs> answers, most people said Crispy Cole. So, really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I also notice he doesn't take his armor off, like, at all this episode, where I'm like, dude, you're such a cool guy. His stupid, his stupid hand of the king chain so dumb <laughs> like it's so lame like i don't know why does he bother me so much oh uh, because oh. he's a really bothersome person and his pious nature makes me want to drown him in a bathtub oh <laughs> uh, the the idea is like he can't wear a hand pin because he has armor so, like, instead, he's wearing, like, the biggest, like... Flashiest <laughs> braided rope of intertwined hands possible. Yes! Yes! <laughs> like, that trip is uncalled for. That's not even... <laughs> that trip is uncalled for is the perfect way to put it. <laughs> it's so much. It's so much. Like, <laughs> it's so over the top. Oh, it makes me laugh every time I see it. I didn't... Okay, so we also had that moment of Aegon going to Aemon mm -hmm. and, like, threatening him. Yeah. I don't understand why he had, like, taken one of the ball, balls from the, um, from the small council meeting and was, like, pushing that ball into his side. I, that was such a weird, like, intimidation tactic. Who's... But okay. Whose, like, marble or granite ball was that? Was that Allison's? I have no idea. I feel like now I need to go back and investigate, like, each piece of granite everybody has in their little uh, tray and see if that was Allison's. Because I kind of assumed that that was his way of telling him, like, I'm getting mom out of here. She can't protect you. Yeah, that would make sense. If someone, someone who's listening, if you know, let us know. It's interesting that Aegon feels threatened by Alicent. 
to that extent that he's like, you're out of here. Or if it's just like he needs he needs full control and her like naysaying him in the corner makes him look like a child and he can't have that. Yeah, I think that Eamon likes to have yes men around him. He's obviously struggled to take direction his whole life. And I don't think that he appreciates how his mother and Crispy raise their voices against his plans. He's so fully villain right now. Like I don't, it's almost becoming a bit like cartoon villain. Yeah, me. yeah, like where he's got that villain for the sake of being a villain thing going on. Yeah, yeah, like it's a little, it's a little one note. And that's, that's what I was know, thinking, is it's a little one note. It's fine for villains, like not every villain has to be incredibly compelling in terms of like, I don't know, like entertaining. But I think because he's kind of just like, I'm just like this through and through. It loses a little bit of that excitement, I guess, because it becomes very predictable. Yeah, because if you think about it, Damon is kind of a villain too, but he is a far more intriguing and enjoyable to watch villain because he has a lot of layers to what's happening and how he behaves. I feel like that fully came out once we scooped Damon up and took him away from his, it's always like his, like his love interest. So like, villainous Damon killing his wife like one note Damon Damon like choking Rhaenyra out and arguing with her kind of the same thing but now that he's like tripping and he's with the Strongs and he's around Alice and he's kind of wheeling and dealing with the Riverlanders then you start to see more sides of him and he becomes much more engaging much more entertaining where Aemon I don't know he needs he needs some conversations with people that aren't his mother or crispy or his infirmed brother. Yeah. Yeah, actually that's a good point to make. There aren't a lot of times that we see conversations that Eamon's having with anybody outside of those people. I think the only one that I can think of was his mistress that we saw this episode. But I don't think he really talked. He was just kind of fetal position the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> His conversation with Lord Laris for this episode was interesting because you can tell that he enjoys taunting people. True, true. And I struggle to see how he doesn't know how that's going to get him killed. Yeah, I totally forgot about Laris this episode as well. That's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. He's... He's not a very good master of whispers. <laughs> Masaria has outpaced him this episode. By a long shot. By a long shot, which is unfortunate. I feel like Loras would have a different game plan. He would have something better. He didn't, though. All he really had was like, hey, Eamon, you need a hand. And then Eamon was like, yeah, you're right. And then he's like, I could never dream of having this honor bestowed on me. And Eamon was like, LOL, because I'm not. Go get my dick. Go get my grandfather. How do you think Otto High? Because I don't think Otto Hightower is going to be as pliable as Eamon seems to believe he will be. That's a really good call. If he survives long enough, I could see it being very contentious and him getting sacked immediately because Otto won't put up with that. Otto's always going to see him as a child his grandchild, I could see it not lasting very long between the two of them unless Otto is constantly delivering wins. Yeah. You know, Otto and Allison seem to be the only people who really see Eamon for what he is. And I know that like Crispy Cole is also seeing Eamon for what he really is now. And so I do think that calling Otto Hightower in his hand is... A good choice but at the same time I don't think it's going to go exactly how Eamon thinks it's going to go. Agreed. I'm really excited for him to come back though. Yeah I just don't see Grandpa Hightower as one to be bossed around. No and also it'll kind of be interesting to see Otto's interactions with Crispy considering their last conversation. Yeah Otto's got beef with half the people there. Yep. And now they're going to put him back in a really high power position. And they've lost the high tower, the green side. They've lost men at arms. Last season, there was that moment where they kind of like, well, it wasn't even kind of, they imprisoned 
half the royals in King's Landing to weed out who was loyal to them or not, or who was loyal to Rhaenyra, and they killed Beesbury. And I did get that, like, mention where it's like, we lost the Beesberries. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, yeah, because in this well, episode, they said the Beesberries have risen up against the high towers. Yep. So, I mean, we know that it was, like, Otto's doing. Like, that was his idea. He was controlling things in that way. I feel like he's going to come back with a little bit more pomp, like, a little bit, a little spring in his step. Like, I hope daddy's so. back to fix things. <laughs> oh, I hope he comes in with unhinged confidence. I think that's going to be one of the things I'm looking forward to next episode. But also... It's time for the dragon seeds. Like, come on. I can't believe the dragon seeds was going to be like a seven, a seven episode arc. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I always think is that Aemon is a little too confident in Vagar. That some of that arrogance and belligerent confidence he has is completely sourced from how powerful Vagar is. Could you imagine if Vagar died, but he lived? Like the scenario where the dragon died, but the writer survived? Yeah, I mean, how is he going to behave when he doesn't have Va- Vagar backing his play? That's he what wouldn't. I would be he interested would... to see. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess he's still like a pretty confident swordsman. So like, he's a good fighter. But still, without, without Vagar, he's just a good fighter. And like a yeah. petulant child. So Oh, the most petulant child. I love how Allison's always like trying to be like, your wrongs of the past still not been righted yet. As though that's yeah. gonna change his course. Like, why does she always say the wrong thing to her children? It's like she she doesn't have any sort of real capacity to speak to them in a way that is meaningful to them. It's unfortunate, but also gentle parenting has kind of like left. <laughs> like, I think we're past that. Oh, that left now the she's chat just like, <laughs> yeah. before it could even happen. <laughs> yeah. So you said you had a question for me. I do. Me. I do. I want to know who you think wears it best. And we're talking about silver hair. Okay. Will, would it be Lucius Malfoy from Harry Potter, Thranduil from The Hobbit? slash Lord of the Rings universe, Mm -hmm. Legolas's father, for anybody who's not Mm -hmm. sure, or Aemond. Thranduil. Hands down. A thousand percent, a million times, Lee Pace, man. Lee Pace. The actor that plays that man, look, look. Serving. I'm not serving. I am not one to fangirl over an actor, but everything this man does Everything this man does, I'm just like, you're the greatest, you're the best. Even his role in Foundation, where he is just the most, like, evil, most hate, like, oh, he's so awful. He's so terrible. He's a terrible person. But, like, I can't even hate him because he's just, like, he just has that, I don't know. He's just got that star quality, man. He does. I love it. Always serving a look, always serving hair, like... Yes. The Malfoy, the Malfoy guy. Lucius Malfoy serves in that hair, too. He does. Thinking about Legolas. Legolas is like, eh, okay, whatever. But not... He doesn't serve. He doesn't have that... That quality that about quality. him. Yeah. Mm-mm. He doesn't have runway quality about him. <laughs> no, he does not. No, he does not. So on this show, who do you think has the most servable runway wig? Um, Well, I guess hairstyle, but yeah, wig. Ooh, I'm going to either go with Corliss or Bela. Yeah, yeah, Corliss. I do love Corliss's hair. Yeah, that's true. He's always serving a very nice hairstyle. I love, too, that like, I mean, for one, they gave him dreads, which... Like, he just instantly looks cool, and he's got that whole, like, yeah, like, King of the Tides thing going on. Yeah. It's a little bit pirate-coded in a way. He just looks cool. Him and his armor with the the dreads. Oh, God, yeah. Corley's is serving. And I gotta... Definitely. Yeah, and I gotta give it up to Bela, because she's, like, the only Targaryen who does not need a complex hairstyle in order for her hair to look killer. Agreed. 
agreed. You know who else has amazing, amazing hair that isn't a wig and it surprised me? Ooh, who? Allison. The actress that plays Allison, that is her natural hair. Oh, wow. Not co- I, don't, I don't think the color is natural, but it she has, has no incredible hair. No additional hair is put in. I don't know. She might have some... Like some volume bundles? Yeah. Like she might... They might have added like thickness to it but i'm pretty sure the length is hers oh wow actually that makes sense now that i'm thinking about it because if you've worked in hair or in wigs or anything like that you kind of get an eye for telling when something is the way her hair lays at the scalp line is is nice it's very nice yeah she she's been blessed by the hair gods definitely she definitely has been. I, I'm surprised to know that that's her hair. I just assumed that they were all wigs. Right? But this feels like a very, a very nice spot to wrap things up. Talking about, <laughs> talking about some very positive things like good hair, good vibes, serve good and armor, looks. serve and looks. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We will be back with the final episodes. And we will see you then.